Hey guys, Joey Answer here. Um, this is the episode one Q&A video where I'm going to start things off by answering the questions you guys put in for episode one. There are a whole load of questions. We had over 200 comments to sift through. So I've tried to pick uh, a range of comments that are very episode one specific or questions that a lot of you guys have asked. So without further ado, let's start off the process. Robert Bartlett asked, how did you decide when to speak English and when to speak Japanese? It just seemed like a great balance between the two languages. Good question. Um, we wanted this series to be bilingual from the get-go because that's the only way to get an authentic um, telling of, of the Street Fighter story. You and Ken trained in Japan. They're naturally going to speak Japanese. However, Ken is American. He speaks English naturally. We would have worked out that you would have learnt English from Ken, hence having somewhat of a um, of an American accent when he speaks English. Also, Goken would have encouraged you to learn English because he knows that one day Ryu's going to have to take his own mushashugyo and go out into the big wide world and English is one of the most widely spoken in languages in the world. So in the same way that Gorken learned English from Gortetz and Sayaka, he's passing it down. So for anyone wondering, oh, why does, why does do you speak English so well? There's a reason because they're going to they're gonna end up going to America one day and Gorken as a kind of father figure and sensei to do you knows that it takes more than just martial arts skills to do it. So we consulted Togo Igawa, who plays Gortetz and Goma. He was also, for you, those of you who don't know, he was the Japanese language specialist. He translated all of the Japanese sections of dialogue. So I was working with him alongside Chris over a year and a half ago, going through the script, going through those sections that needed to be in Japanese and making sure the nuances were right. Togo also, his wife, is English. Now, she speaks fluent Japanese as well. And it's interesting when you get um, mixed culture, mixed race couples that speak two different languages in which both parties can speak both languages to ask them, when do you speak English? When do you speak Japanese? Now, sometimes he would say, if we're joking about something, it may be more fitting to use Japanese or if they're having an argument Japanese may be used in preference of English, etc., etc. Or sometimes he will ask her a question in English and she would respond in Japanese. So there is this kind of natural flip and switch between the two languages depending on what you're trying to articulate. And we try to put that into the series. When Gorken is teaching something traditional martial arts wise, he typically uses Japanese. When he's trying to get through to Ken on more of an uh, emotional or personality level he'll sometimes appeal to that side of him by using English whereas you he'll speak to in Japanese more for example uh, so we went through until it had a good balance and a fit there's almost about 50 50 English to Japanese throughout the series and certain times I think a lot of it stayed the way we scripted it but occasionally Akira may say, I think it would be better to say this line in Japanese, not English, and we would incorporate that. So there was a little bit of chopping and changing, but um, it was all agreed quite early on what was going to be in English, what was going to be in Japanese. hope that answers your question, because you're first up, you get the most in-depth answer, but I'm going to try and speed things up, make them a bit more concise. Question number two was from Mark Philip Bernard. Is there, could there be a functional purpose to the Ansatsuken gloves? They don't seem to cover the part of the knuckles that does most of the striking. So I can't help but feel that they're purely aesthetic. Good question. When originally looking at the design of the gloves, I asked myself the same questions, as did Chris. What we both figured is that, look, most people think of gloves as something to protect your opponent by covering your knuckles they're going to kind of protect the opponent where we we saw these unsatsukan mitts as they cover the back of your hand to give you increased blocking power defense against other attacks but it keeps the knuckles exposed so you can still connect and do maximum damage given that the style is a killing art the practitioners would have had very conditioned knuckles in the same way old school karateka 
would do endless hours on the Makawara board and whatnot. Um, so yeah, that is that's my explanation. The Ansatsuki mitts they're designed that way because they're there to give def increased defense when blocking attacks, but give maximum offensive destruction by having hard knuckle on bone when you impact. Third question from Andrew Welbeck. Hi guys. Um, for the first episode, my question is, how hard was it to choose a style of clothing for Mr. Masters, Ryu, and Ken, considering we hardly ever see them dressed as civilians? Uh, well, that's a good question. In terms of, there weren't many references, but if you look at the Street Fighter 2 V series, Ryu dresses quite simply, blue jeans, white t-shirt, and I think that goes well with his personality. Um, we, we had a great costume designer, and ultimately we gave her, myself and Chris gave her briefs. So we, she came up with mood boards, Back to the Future, The Goonies, um, all sort of classic films from our childhood when we grew up that really define the 80s and 80s fashion. Um, we used as kind of mood boards and thought, okay, well, if these kids existed in that time period, they would dress much in the way that other kids then did. Ken, naturally, you can see we've always tried to incorporate some kind of red into his civilian gear. That, like, red is really his colour, so there's always a little bit of red in whatever Ken's wearing. You sticks to slightly more primary and muted colour palette. There's always white in what he's wearing. Um that goes with his colour. Um, Mr. Masters as well. Just comes to having good costume design, doing your research, seeing what fits with the character. You'll try certain things on an actor and you just say, it may be accurate to the time zone, but it just doesn't look good, or that's not you, or that's not Ken. And eventually you find something like, yeah, that's the one. Uh, question number four. One of our super fans, Kevin Jason R. Oriado. Uh, since you guys created the character Gorma, does Capcom have any plans on putting him in a new Street Fighter game? I would so love to play Gorma. Uh, good question and good request. He was a character that was completely devised by us. He does not exist anywhere in the Street Fighter universe. Um, I'll add something on to that Gorma question because there have been a whole load of other Gorma questions. A lot of, um, wanted to pay homage to a lot of these anime and Japanese kind of storytelling where there's often a crazy character. There's often a kooky, often inexplicably so, character thrown into what is often an otherwise fairly serious script. A good example would be 13 Assassins by Takashi Miike. And, um, you have that crazy guy who sort of lives in the forest who ends up helping the samurai at the end. And he seems seemingly invulnerable as well. You actually think at the end, is this guy like a Tengu? Is he meant to be a forest spirit or not? Um, so we wanted a character like that that would give some comic relief and would abuse Ken. It's just, you know, our funny sense of humour. Wouldn't it be funny if this guy just has, you know, was racist against Ken? But then we can use that later as a plot point that drives Ken to overcome some element in his training, as you see with his Hadouken, when he finally does a full-length Hadouken. Um, and then it was like, cool, why don't we have this guy be Gotetsu's younger brother as well? Um, so what started off is, is, is a, is a, is a cr kooky character that would add breadth to the world, because you've got to remember, when we started writing the script, it's just Ryuken Goken. And it's like, where, where is everyone else? We need to see evidence of other people that live in this world. Um, so by having this crazy fisherman character that's always there when you and Ken are training by the lake, it, it adds a bit more dimension. It gives someone else for the characters to bounce off. Um, it would be great because, look, I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but Gorma was an Ansatsu Ken high-level student, and he almost followed Golki's similar path to go off to try and become the Shinoni, to try and master the Shingoku Sats and, and, and tap into Dark Hado. Um, so as a result, uh, who knows, if he gets his memory back, there's a chance we could see him as a fighting character further on down the line, and wouldn't he be cool to be in the game as well? Uh, 
Question number five from Ryan Miller. In the beginning scenes while running through the forest, how many takes of Christian kicking Mike did you do? I can imagine several ways for that to go wrong. Did you guys clearly clear out that path yourselves or was it just there and ready for you? There was an existing or multiple paths going through this forest in uh, Sofia, Bulgaria. Uh, we had to really be sure to clear glass out of the ground, stones and glass. There was a strong risk that these guys could cut their feet. And again, it would be very, very easy to put these guys in trainers, but Ryu and Ken are that hardcore that they do everything in bare feet. They've got those conditioned martial artists bare feet, so we didn't want to cheat on that. Um, so yeah, they suffered. They did suffer, and um, it's not comfortable on the feet. But uh, we picked various different sections of different paths to make the route down. Um, and a lot of that's done editorially. You just get as much coverage as you can um, finding logs and stuff for them to vault over um, and the split in the path which I, I'm really pleased worked out where they kind of split to two different routes and you can see that path reconverge when Ken does the flying sidekick uh, so yeah it was a good half day filming all kinds of different paths then running down uh, number six question from Abigail Chand Hey Joey, Christian, the SFAF team. How much input did you guys have into the design aspect of the set's costumes? Did any of you create drawing sketches to show exactly what you guys envisioned for the series? If so, will those sketches be included in the book that will accompany the series? Great question. Um, massively. Um, creatively, there's nothing that doesn't um, go by us first. Um, we all wore a lot of hats on this series. Now, you've got, got to understand that Christian Howard is a really talented artist and did a degree in art and design. So he's great drawing. He, he's great at storyboarding. So visually, we can discuss something, and Chris has the ability to, to knock it up very quickly. So I knew what I liked costume-wise, and ultimately the buck would stop with me, but... I really put a lot of kind of responsibility onto Chris in terms of like the dojo designs. It's amazing. Both Gotet's and Gorken's dojo. Christian did the original sort of architectural designs of them with dimensions and heights and stuff and did a lot of research at various dojos and traditional um, Buddhist temples and things like that in Japan. Um, same with the costumes. Chris had done a whole load of sketches that then... Working with Emily Rose Eaxis, our costume designer, um, we, we had very specific, certain things weren't open to interpretation at all. They had to be exactly as either myself or Chris or both of us decided this is how it must be. Um, and Emily Rose worked very well bringing her ideas to the table on how to bring what we wanted to life and make it work. Even things like the the frayed sleeves on Akuma's gi. I mean, you've got to understand, for them to stand out in the right way, you need to actually sew wire into the fabric so it sits and holds in the right way. It's not a matter of just cutting shark's teeth into your gi, which is why most you won't see any cosplay costumes that look as authentic as ours because like, you really got to work a kind of inner structure sometimes into something as simple as frayed sleeves. But yeah, the, the production design book will show all of Christian Howard's original dojo designs, his costume design work. We'll see uh, Emily Rose, our costume designer, all of her fantastic design work. We will see uh, Antonello Rubino, our production designer. He took Chris's original dojo designs and then working with his draftsman, created Ricardo, created um, you know this hyper-detailed full architectural drawings uh which was then what we went on to build uh the set the set designers built and constructed these things so you're going to see all of that as much as that as possible we're going to put into the production design book for you to see uh number seven question seven from brian neal first and foremost thank you for doing this series thank you very much um, it's the best live action adaptation out there and definitely raised the standards. The locations used in the series and in Street Fighter Legacy were awesome. How long did it take to scout out these locations? Um, Legacy, you know, that's in the past. 
we naturally scouted. We actually shot Legacy, for those of you who are interested, in a place called Ashridge Estate, uh, north of London, near Hertfordshire. For Assassin's Fist, the location scouting process happened over two years ago. So a long time before we started filming, we went over to Bulgaria. Um, I had already shot a film there in the past. So that was one of the reasons I wanted to shoot there. Um, and for example, there's a film called Ninja that my good friend Scott Adkins stars in. And they built a big Japanese dojo plus compound in Bulgaria for that film and that set was left standing for many years so I was hoping that we could take that set and just kind of spruce it up or modify it and use that for Gotetsu's dojo but by the time we came ready to film they had converted it into a Turkish bathhouse so it was like okay well that that goes up in smoke so we ended up building and designing our dojo from scratch which I think worked out for the best in the end um uh Things like the cave. So we always, the caves were already always in the script. But when we went to Bulgaria, so Europa Film, which was the Bulgarian production company that we partnered with that helped produce this out in Bulgaria, they did a great location recce for us. And we went to visit various caves. And there were specific caves that had these eyes, these demon eyes in the ceiling. And it was just like, you can't make this shit up. This couldn't be more perfect this is the place so then those eyes were then written i went back and we added them into the script and made them a real feature of the story um so you get happy coincidences like that you already have your locations written in your script you then try and find those locations and sometimes what you find is far better than what you had hoped for and then that ends up becoming part of your script so yeah there you go uh question eight from invince miss uh, you guys must have dreamed of this every night for the past years since Legacy, or heck, even your entire life. Mind telling us the emotions and the reactions from members of the original Legacy team felt seeing Ryu, Ken, Gorkin, Gorki, and Gortets in the flesh, in their geese, in the dojo. It's amazing. You know, you kind of... Making a film, from a producer point of view, if it's your project you're developing... It takes so long, it's such a long road to get there and so much is on the line. So when you're actually there and your, your dojo's there and you're in the mountains and you see Ryu and Ken come out of their trailers you know, with hair and makeup and costume on and Gorkin's there and the Makawara board, it's amazing. It was such a cool, you know, by all rights I should have got severely ill making that film because I was directing it I was a writer on it I was starring in it as well I was choreographing and training the rest of the actors I was doing 50 you know 20 hour days working with lucky to get five hours sleep every night for seven and a half weeks um so stress overload pressure 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 but being out in the mountain air every day in the sun seeing my fantasy come to life that's the most energizing, enriching, and working with friends, people I love, people that I'm close with. Um, it's, it's a great feeling, and it's amazing the kind of healing effect that can have. Otherwise, if I wasn't happy and I wasn't living my fantasy, you know, um, I probably would have fallen very ill on that film. But it was great, man. It's, it's hard to put into words because you've got to take into account, as you said, all the years and stuff, but it's amazing. It's something I cherish, and... Um, sometimes you're so busy at the time that sometimes you, you have to snap yourself to I must take this in and appreciate it because filming will stop and we'll be back in London or whatever and, and, and it will all be gone, it'll be like a dream but we've got hours of behind the scenes footage to remind us of what it was like being there but it's very cool, it's very cool uh, question 9, it's going to be a long video it's going to be over 20 minutes um, why does this always happen? okay Question nine, Reality Nichols. If Ryu's key is a cool wave and Ken's own is warm or hot, what is Gokun's key flow like? Good question. We didn't address that. From my experience, having done Japanese martial arts, I did Bujinkan ninjutsu for many years, over a decade. And um, unlike Chinese Kung Fu styles that use different animal styles, a lot of Japanese budo martial arts have different elements so you can do the same technique with an earth key or a fire key or a wind key or water key or nothingness you know moo 
Um, I would almost say Gokan has an earth key. He's very grounded. He's very strong. He's very steadfast. His demeanor, his manner, the solid, the solid nature of his techniques. So yeah, if he if he had to have a key type, I would say it's an earth earth key. Um, question ten, Alexa Bartolov, you really presented the bomb between you Ken and Gorken like it should be. You did an amazing job. Did you train or spar together before the shoot? Or did you produce all that chemistry right there on set? Luckily, Akira, who plays Gorken, was cast out of London, and he lives in London. Um, Gotets, played by Togo Ogawa, he lives in London, as do I and Christian Howard. So we all got to spend a lot of time getting to know each other. Um, particularly, most importantly, Christian Howard and Akira, to build up that relationship between master and student. Um, not the same amount as Mike. Mike, obviously, over Skype, Christian and Mike got to know each other through Skype. I had met Mike in LA previous. Mike and Akira didn't meet until they were in Bulgaria. Uh, but look, Mike is a super affable guy. If you can't tell already from his videos, it, it's very easy to, to make friends with Mike very quickly. Uh, Chris is a real joker. Um and likes to keep things light. And Akira is just, um, he's like your dad. He's got this great kind of warm, you're my family energy. So the chemistry hit off very quickly, which was really nice. And you see it on the screen, that's the key. I think we did a lot of activities. We always ate dinner together at the same time. We would go to the gym and do weights together, practice choreography together, hang out and let our hair down and have a drink, whatever, um, on the weekend or on a day off filming. So. The chemistry was really there, and we had a lot of good times together. Uh, and it shows on screen. Right, last question I'll try and squeeze in for Safaraz Janjua, another super fan. Okay, he's got a couple of questions. Uh, where you guys filmed is such a beautiful, beautiful part of Bulgaria. You truly created the perfect Japan for Ryu and Ken. How did SFAF end up in Bulgaria, and were there ever any other locations in mind before? I've already answered a bit about why Bulgaria. Um, good cruise, it's quite cheap to film there, close enough to London that we're not having to travel a million miles away. We did consider New Zealand. We uh, Last Samurai was shot in New Zealand, which doubled for Japan. We did consider Canada at one point as well, but Bulgaria ended up being the best fit, and it really does do well um, in terms of doubling Japan. Number two, the lake run. Was it done in one take, and how long did both Mike and Chris run for? It wasn't done in one take. It was lots of setups of lots of different sections. Easily, you know, third of a day, I don't know, a good a good few hours were spent doing that nonstop. And they had to run a lot, you know, bruised soles of feet on hard, com compacted earth. Um, his last question, casting the younger Ryu and Ken, great choices, but what did you guys go through? Did you guys go through a few people before finding them? Um, Look, it costs, from a production point of view, unfortunately, unless you have unlimited budget or huge budget, some of your casting choices are restricted by where. If you've got to fly in a kid actor for Ken from America with per diems, with hotels, with flights, with a chaperone, suddenly that's a huge chunk of money that could be maybe better spent on screen. So we were under pressure for some of the slightly smaller parts to cast them from Bulgaria. So both the brilliant actors you saw playing Ryu and Ken, little Ryu and Ken and even baby Ryu, we cast out of Bulgaria. And uh, yeah, I think we got good matches and we were happy with their performances. And I'm sure they're chuffed to bits to, to be in a show that's going to be seen by millions of people around the world. Um, so at almost 25 minutes, that sums up uh, this video. Uh, we will put up uh, the episode two post uh, soon, and then you'll get your questions in for that. And uh, hopefully Christian Howard will take over answering your questions for episode two. Uh, as you can see, the Ken theme, the Ken single is now out and available to buy. Please do support the series, buy the album. It's really a great, um, it's really a great soundtrack by Patrick Gill and the songs contributed by by Ryan Anser, my brother, and Daniel Brain. The Ken theme, fight the fight, playing to win. They're all great. So please do. It's a purchase you won't regret. 
and um, you know I love score music just as a little random fact almost all I listen to is movie music because it's kind of really designed to drive your emotions and drive your imagination you know so much of the emotion you feel when you watch a film is actually being engineered by the music um, so I think if you're a writer if you're a creative out there, listen to more score music. It's really going to enhance your imagination and your creativity and your depth. And uh, a lot of love and passion and nuance went into creating the Assassin's Fist score. So if you haven't bought it yet, do check it out. You won't be disappointed. Um, and you'll also be supporting us, you know. So uh, thank you for taking the time to watch this. I hope you enjoyed the answers to the questions. And check back for the episode two link get your questions in and we'll do it all again and we're going to keep doing this through the whole series cool good to speak to you guys bye bye